So welcome everybody. It's fabulous to see you all here today. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with their and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The countries on which Spinifex offices are situated are Jiru, Banarong, Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Gundungara and Noongar. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. Um, I'm now going to introduce Bronwyn and then I will introduce um, Lara. Bronwyn, uh, who's launching the book, is Professor Emrita of Transnational Studies at the University of Sydney. Uh, she recently published a book called The Political Economy of Same-Sex Marriage, A Feminist Critique. Bronwyn is a lifelong feminist activist and recently uh, has been involved in a number of feminist groups critical of gender self-ID uh, and especially involved in the forthcoming Greenwich Bill, which is going to be debated in New South Wales. She is co-founder and national co-convener of AF4WR, the Australian Feminists for Women's Rights, and actively involved with COAL, Coalition of Activist Lesbians, as well as LGBAA, um, LGB Alliance Australia. In 2002, I had the great pleasure of co-editing with Bronwyn the anthology, September 11, 2001, Feminist Perspectives. That was a wonderful experience, thank you. And now I'll introduce Laura. Uh, Lara, it's been a great pleasure to work with you on this book. Uh, Lara Lacuana studied philosophy at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, an editor and translator specialising in philosophy and social sciences. She has held editorial coordination positions at Paidos Mexicana, Fondo de Cultura e Económica, and Edition SM. As a popularizer of feminism, she is a regular lecturer and writer. In the Spanish speaking world, she is one of the main reference of feminist criticism of the doctrine of gender identity. And this book, which is this one I'm holding up, uh, was also published in Spanish last year, and there'll be more about that later. Thank you very much. Now, Bronwyn, over to you. All right, then. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to be reading on my screen, the same screen as the Zoom's on, but I may look as if I'm not looking directly at you because I'm reading something. <clears throat> okay, so good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on which part of the world you're in right now. I am speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Yuan Nation of the south coast of New South Wales, and more specifically from Sanctuary Point between St George's Basin and Vincentia, in country known in local languages as Bereri or Buderi. That is Bereri Lake or St George's Basin you are seeing in my virtual background. At the very beginning of her book, Laura Lekwona tells us that it was born out of her commitment to feminism and to freedom of speech, both of which she writes, I'm going through a, oh my God, I'm losing my voice, sorry. Mm. <clears throat> Both of which she writes are going through a difficult time at the moment. Indeed they are. Laura also promises to explain these difficulties to us at length, which she does most perspicaciously and with great erudition. Her work is very rigorous, rigorously researched, but also great readability. This last demonstrates that serious research does not need to be either hermetic or boring to read. On the contrary, Lara's research is fascinating. She presents it from a radical feminist position because she tells us radical feminist arguments are rational, rigorous, have great explanatory power and are based on observations of reality, she writes. Contrary, she implies, or I infer, to the gender twaddle that is now routinely dished up to us as truth. It would perhaps be premature to say that the market for gender abolitionist writing is now saturated, but I am encouraged by the fact that it is becoming more and more densely populated and Spinifex Press is a significant contribu contributor to this population growth. Laura's book is a wonderful contribution to this growing body of work and one of its critical 
crucial and most illuminating aspects is to do with the fact that few works available in English in the gender critical or gender abolitionist space have to date taken us outside the Anglosphere. Kaisa Eckes Ekman's book on the meaning of sex, also published by Spin Effects, which I had the pleasure to launch last year, is one of them. And Laura's is another. I learned a lot about what is happening in Mexico as well as in Spain by reading this book. As someone who has always been passionate about transnational feminist conversations, I am so pleased that we have access in English to these accounts and analyses of feminist experience beyond the Anglosphere. It is still far too rare a thing. We don't have enough translators nor enough money to pay them. We don't have access to so many feminist voices raising protest, voices that speak to their context and to those beyond, voices that seek to make connections between us if only we had a common language of words with which to express our common feminist language. We who live in that powerful behemoth that is the Anglosphere are impoverished by these absences. Yet, ironically, it is precisely the powerful infrastructure of the Anglosphere or in some cases the Eurosphere, that gives women opportunities to be published and read, including by women from their own countries and languages. Which is why Moroccan feminist Fatima Menisi, for example, told us she published in English and French because first, no Arabic language publisher would touch her work, and second, by publishing in English, and particularly French, she provided Maghrebian women with access to her research. Laura's experience is not precisely the same, but not entirely dissimilar either. She tells us in an afterword to this English language edition that she had to self-publish her book in its original Spanish after the publisher, Sigo Ventiuno Editores, 21st century publishers, postponed indefinitely publication on the eve of the Guadalajara Book Fair in November 22, where Laura's book was to be presented. They did so in response to threats by transgender activists, of course. This action by Signo Ventiono is all the more ironic and all the more telling of the new authoritarianism we are now facing in that the publisher was founded in 1965 by Mexican intellectuals, she tells us, as a response to an act of government censorship. Ain't that ironic? This is also, of course, why we need independent radical feminist publishers. There are far too few of them remaining. The problems Laura discusses are by now not new to us, although many of the examples presented and authors cited are, but her articulation of them is fantastically clear and useful, all the more because she presents sensible and practical suggestions for addressing the sorts of problems she analyzes. I will now walk you through the six chapters of Laura's book, far too briefly, unfortunately, due to time constraints. So chapter one, is etymological. It is titled Gender, It's Complicated, with It's Complicated being in inverted commas for reasons you will understand. <clears throat> in this first chapter, Laura discusses the extensive confusion and obfuscation surrounding the term gender and usefully walks us back through some early radical feminist analysis. I am personally very pleased that she links her discussion of Simone de Beauvoir with Adela Turin's wonderful children's book, Candy Pink, a sort of second six fable for children, which I read in French translation or way back when. Pleased also to read her discussion of Elena Giannini, Bellotti's important but often overlooked 1973 book, Dalla parte delle bambine, which I read in the, in the original Italian. Um, and we don't talk about that book enough. It's a great book. So I'm glad you do, Laura. She goes on to discuss the genderist misappropriation and distortion of radical feminist language. And she talks about all sorts of other authors known to us in the Anglosphere as well, but I can't, I can't mention everyone. She goes on to discuss the genderist misappropriation and distortion of radical feminist language, which I personally believe was in part enabled by the terrible mistranslation into English of Simone de Beauvoir's celebrated sentence, on ne n'est pas femme, on ne devient. Beauvoir was referring to being educated into this social construct called woman. The sentence opens her chapter on childhood, the first in volume two on women's lived experience, the first volume being facts and myths. But the addition of the article a, as in becomes a woman, <clears throat> in the original partially, tra partially translation, opened the door to all sorts of bizarre appropriations. In any case, as Laura points out, had people bothered to actually read Beauvoir's book, they could not possibly have twisted her words around the way they have. But hey, why seek to understand and analyze when a simple click plate slogan will do? 
The example of Beauvoir's famous sentence, which everyone knows, even mistranslated, even when they haven't read the book, points not only to the facile sloganizing of a poorly understood snippet from a body of walk, work, but also to the importance of translation to the international reception of a work. A small mistranslation can have monumental impacts. As Renata commented to me in emailing me the PDF of Laura's Spanish original, I haven't had time to read it, but I've dipped into it from time to time. Translating a work is almost like writing another book. Having done quite a bit of translating and studying of translations in my years, I can attest to the immense work of reflection and deliberation that goes into that enterprise. As Laura's book, and in, in particular this first chapter, deal at some length with the use of language to obfuscate rather than elucidate, I thought it worth making this wee point here. Especially as so, so, so much of the impact of gender identitarianism is an exercise in ensuring that deciders get so lost in translation under the voluminous barrage of accusations and propaganda that is machined gunned at them on a regular basis, as Laura puts it, that they simply capitulate. Maria e Venceras, or muddle and conquer, as Laura puts it. The institution of genderous institutionalization of genderous double think can be traced back at least as far as 1995, as Laura, Laura discusses, to the UN's Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. She writes, if the feminists who participated in the Fourth World Conference on Women and drafted the Beijing Declaration were interested in drawing a distinction between biological facts and social cultural mandates in order to end discrimination against women and girls stemming from bio biologistic prejudices, what they did was to serve their own heads on a silver platter to the Vatican, which craftily redefined gender as a synonym for sex and tied it to the distinctiveness and complementarity of men and women. She's citing the Vatican. There were unfortunately many heads and many platters to go around. Feminists were well and truly dropped in it by the use of embracing of this term gender, or in many cases, they willingly dropped themselves in it. Let us not forget also that the use of the term gender to talk about people rather than grammatical declensions was not developed by feminists or even women, but by sexologist John Money, whom Laura discusses in her second chapter. Laura's answer, of course, to this deceptively complicated use of the term gender is to simply abolish it. I can but agree. It is not only unnecessary, but the whole gender identitarian arsenal is based on its deployment as a tool of double think and confusion. Chapter two <clears throat> is theoretical. It is titled, fittingly, three theories about transgenderism, which are the medical sexological model to which pathologies and hormones and sword with, with, with pathologies and hormones and surgeries to fix them. We find here the aforementioned discussion of John Money. The transgenderist model to do with depathologization, but still hormones and surgeries to enable people to become their true selves. In both cases, there are no end of charlatans promising miracle solutions to the people they mutilate. And the third is the radical feminist model. You will surely be familiar with these theories in more or less detail, but the details Laura provides are so fascinating, often chillingly so, and include again examples from Mexico and Spain about which we had hitherto heard little. You will be unsurprised to learn that the only overlaps she finds between the radical feminist model and one, uh, one or both of the other two are the belief that those who deviate from expected behavior conforming to sexist stereotypes are not ill or abnormal, yet are rejected by society and suffer distress. The multiple points of disagreement lie, of course, in the solutions. Also in this chapter, Laura engages in an activity dear to my own heart, bith busting. Some of you will know that the group I co-convene, Australian Feminists for Women's Rights, or AFORWA, produced its own myth busting dossier in 2022, and we are constantly expanding on it. Laura provides some excellent material to help this exercise along, all the more because she extends it beyond assertions of so-called fact, such as that regarding murders of trans-identified males, to moralistic assertions aimed to censor the criticism. If you're not trans, you can't talk about us. And if you do, then it's your fault we've heard it. To good behavior rules for trans allies, which can be summarized by A, unconditional validation, and B, refusing to listen to those nasty, nasty cis women. This myth-busting exercise evidences the transgenderist movement's troubled relationship with the truth, as Laura puts it. 
And she exposes in some detail this troubled relationship using the September 22 example of a small scandal that unfolded in Mexico City. And that is a fully fledged portrait of trans activism and its institutional penetration. And I hope she's going to expand. I'm talking about the Capital 21 incident. And I hope you'll expand on that for us in a moment because I don't have time. They lie, we know, she writes. What is alarming is that people and institutions from whom one would expect a little more insight believe them and are frightened by their actions, threats and tantrums. Unquote. Indeed. Chapter three is biblical, which is fitting given its subject matter. Titled, In the Beginning Was the Pronoun, it explores what happens when one, trying to be nice and empathetic, she writes, gives in to blackmail or extortion. It is as if pronouns have suddenly acquired the status of honorifics. Except that professional or academic titles, for example, contrary to preferred pronouns, are hardly considered matters of life and death. I am not going to suicide if you don't call me Professor Winter, I, I assure you. Laura cites, cites Colum Colombian writer Carolina Sanin, and I love this, I love this citation, I, I can't do it in full, but um, there's some of it for whom the phrase, my pronouns, is already the ridiculousness of arrogance and tyrannical childishness. To believe that one has one's own, own pronouns is the delirium of private property and it is pure megalomania. Language is the private property of no one. But if the be kind narrative doesn't work, compelled speech regulations by institutions, social media or publishers um, often do. Thou shalt not misgender if thou wishest not to discover why hell has nine circles. Chapter four deals with mythology. In particular, transgender cult's most pervasive and noxious myth, that of the transgender child. There is so much I could say about this chapter. Mm -hmm. It's fascinated, for example, to discover the myth of the indigo child, which Laura uses as a comparator for the mythological trans child and found the connection she makes between the comeback within sections of the gay movement of the idea that homosexuality is innate and it's that's really pervasive younger younger generations of lesbians and gay men are firmly convinced that it's innate now and that worries me and the idea that piggybacked onto it that transgender is innate and of course with the concomitant introduction of the idea of rectification of birth certificates to fit this innate identity as we know Educational institutions and legislators are key drivers of the success of this mythology, from school guidelines to children's books. Laura gives the example of stories for pink-brained boys and blue-brained girls, published by Spanish Youth Association Crisadas, to what Laura dubs the Ministry of Magic Administrative Services, in an ironic nod, no doubt, to J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. The ministry in question here is Mexico City. She writes, if we are to believe Mexico City Council's city's council for the prevention and elimination of discrimination, this rectification of minors' birth certificates in line with gender identity breaks down all barriers so that transgender minors have the guarantee of a life free from violence and discrimination. So why, asked Laura, don't we extend this administrative magic to the four million Mexican children and adolescents living in extreme poverty? or to the 340,000 girls between 15 and 19 years old and 5,000 under 15 who give birth in this country every year. Surely they could do with state institutions guaranteeing them some rights even more pressing than the right to identify themselves with this or that pronoun. But there is happily pushback. In Spanish schools, it comes from the Guto Centres Femenistas por la Coeducación, Feminist Teachers for Coeducation, Short and Fluid Dogo Femco. I was pleased to see the name of Silvia Carrasco come up in this discussion because I heard Silvia speak last year at the mini conference organized in Paris by the Observatoire de la Petite Sirene. She was one of the few women in a conference sadly dominated by men. Yes, the organizers did get feedback from me and a number of other women about that. You should also know that Silvia was a member of a five woman panel from four countries that was canceled last year at the annual conference of the American Anthropological Association held in Montreal. Montreal. And she's spoken at Feminist Question, Question Time webinars run by WDI, as many of you would know. I can talk more about the myth of the trans child. No time. Moving on. Chapter five. 
As is fitting in discussion in the Re evolution of religions, chapter five deals with colonization and with proselytism. It is titled Feminism and Women's Spaces. Laura discusses the ways in which the trans Trojan horse is double speaking its way into appropriation of this movement and these spaces, and women like the good citizens of Troy are inviting them in. Of course, the performative utterance, trans women are women, will not make this true by force of repetition, she tells us, nor will it make people really believe it. But what it will do when used as a bullying tactic is to make women understand that they had better act if they, as if they believe it for fear of the consequences if they do not. Feminism even has become another of those exercises in Dumble speak. It really is having a hard time right now. Just as gender can be understood as one thing and its opposite at the same time, Laura writes, the word feminism has been manipulated and emptied of content to the extent that today some women can passionately dedicate themselves to destroying everything feminism has fought for and still call themselves feminist. Again, Mexican institutions are singing from the global liberal capitalist playbook, whether we're talking about universities, women's toilets and change rooms, prisons, women's shelters, sports, or electoral parity. I would have loved to have had time here to talk to you about the incidents at UNAM, um, Laura's alma mater, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and the state elections in Oaxaca, sorry, I have trouble pronouncing that one, the former involving violence against lesbians, and the latter being a fairly complicated story involving, among other things, full trans grabbing spots reserved for women on electoral lists, and appropriation of traditional non-conforming indigenous identities in the name of transgender politics. We have seen this happen worldwide. For example, little plug, I discuss its impact in French Polynesia in my chapter on gay wedding tourism in my political economy of same-sex marriage book. But those are really interesting stories. I hope Laura talks to you about them. Chapter six, nearing the end here, which is the last chapter, it focuses on other collateral damage from this holy war on women. It discusses the harms done to children, to desisters and detransitioners, to trans widows, to families of trans children, and of course, to freedom of speech. This is perhaps the greatest casualty because when our freedom of expression is shut down, all the rest is enabled. As Laura puts it, this current tendency of rejecting the diversity of ideas by people who claim to be pro-diversity has the effect of inhibiting debate, impoverishing discussion and curbing critical thinking. We have enough examples, both real world and fictional, of where such tendencies may lead. But in her conclusion, Laura ends on a note of hope. Thanks to feminist campaigns, thanks to those who speak out, Laura tells us, the tide is beginning to turn and it is a little less risky, a little, to take a stand now than it was a few years ago. Keep in mind, she writes, that the more of us there are, the harassment will be distributed among more people and it will be less overwhelming. This is true, strength in numbers. Everyone from their own place and under their own circumstances can do something. No action is too small. So let's set an example and start rebuilding the feminism that was taken from us. Thank you, Laura, for this wonderful book. And now from you, I'd really, I mean, you may have other things you want to say to us, but I'd really like to hear more, and I'm sure our listeners would like to hear more about the Capital 21 case in Mexico or the other cases I just mentioned, such as the Yunnan or Oaxacan cases that I haven't had time. And another thing I'd really like you to talk to us about is this curious term, diversidades sexogenericas. What is supposed uh -huh. to be that's used by the, the faculty council, UNAM, yeah? what this term is supposed to mean, how long it's been in use, who started using it, whether it appears in legal or institutional documents, whether it's specific to, to, to Mexico, because I found it really bizarre. Not only sex and sex gender together, but also diversities. So we have more than one diversity. So this is, this is, this is gobbledygook. So I'd sort of like you to unpack that a little bit for, for us among all the other gobbledygook that we're faced with. This is a, this is a new element. So thank you again. And over to you. Thank you, Bronwyn. I, I loved your your presentation and how how you how you uh, level each of the chapters. And the first one is about etymology. The second one about theory. The third one is biblical. I love that thing. And um, it, it, uh, I'll start by answering your your last question. Diversidades sexogenéricas. It, it's it's. Um, 
it's one of those many new terms that people uh, people invent to to talk about these topics. Uh, the use of the plural is is very telling from them. For example, um, if you talk about feminism, they say no, 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 no. There are many feminisms, so they use the plural in order to allow a feminism uh, centered on males, for example. No, that that's another feminism. Yours is one of many. Um, and diversidades sexogenéricas, meaning uh, literally sexogenic diversities. Uh, it, 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 it's a way of, of, of calling all the LGBT, TTQI plus, et cetera, people. It's, it's another word for the, the um, alphabet soup, no? And it's only it sounds interesting to some. Um, what ha happened in Capital 21? Well, when I wrote the book, I was um, using examples of things that were happening in that moment, because if I wrote it now, there would be some other examples. But what uh, am I back? You're back. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, here I am. So I was telling about this uh, Capital 21. There, there was going to be in the university, in the National Autonomous University of Mexico, there was going to be um, a round table to talk about masculinities in plural. But uh, one of the guests was a man who has been accused of transphobia and then everyone around him was transphobic. So it was canceled. I don't like the masculinities uh, thing, but anyway, I support freedom of speech, so I think the university is a good place to talk about these things. And Mauricio Di Meo, the, this guy, he, he has a good approach. He's, he's trying to, to feed some feminism into men's minds, so to say. And, uh, but it was canceled, so this program, Capital 21, this TV show, invited them to talk about it. But all hell broke loose, as, as, as happens with these things. And they wanted the, the host to be uh, dismissed and, and, and um, made redundant. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted everyone involved to get punished, because that's what they want. They want to punish us. And they, and they obeyed them. It was amazing. Uh, there was this uh, institutional uh, office that had to study the, the, the subject, and they determined that they shouldn't have invited those, those people, and that in, in, now they would have to host many transgender people to, to compense for all those, that damage. And it was amazing, especially because uh, there was one guy who was clearly lying because in that show, nothing transphobic at all was said, although transphobic can be anything, but nothing wrong was said, absolutely not. And the guy who accused them said, Mauricio de Meo said this and that. And you only have to listen to what Mauricio de Meo said to know that it was a huge lie. He didn't say what they were accusing him of saying. And nonetheless, the host uh, was, was, was uh, made redundant in the end. That was terrible. And this in Oaxaca is, is, is interesting because some, uh, you, you know, there, there, there are these, these men in Oaxaca who are called mujeres, who are feminine men who dress in women's clothes and they have so, there's some tradition to it. Uh, but now transgenderists saw them as they see uh, uh, people with, with intersex conditions as, as one of them. So now they are transgender. And uh, these mujeres were, going to, were, were uh, competing for some political uh, spots, but then uh, using the ID laws in Oaxaca, some men posed as mujeres and uh, 
uh, initially they were allowed to to participate in these elections as mujeres or women, but the mujeres didn't like it. So so they were uh, taken out of the of the content of, of the elections because the mujeres said they are usurping our identities. And it's it's very funny because when a woman says that that guy is a man and he is uh, posing as a woman, he should not be taken into account. Of course, no one listens, but the the mujeres were listened to. So it was it, it's a very interesting case. And and now let me please. Um, I, I prepared something. Uh, if I have time, I, I'd like to read it. Um, and this is it. Unlike other feminists. Bronwyn Winter among them, or Lear Keith, I wasn't dragged to, into this subject. I didn't arrive to it by force and against my will. I know many colleagues only talk and write about it because it's so important, but for me, it has been fascinating from the start. Of course, I am awfully worried about what this ideology does to women and girls, but as a subject matter, it is most interesting to me. Researching about it has led me to several radical feminist thinkers. Most of all, it is clear to me that transgenderism is not the newest enemy of women. It is the same enemy it has always been. They are waving against us the same, the very same war with a vengeance. It's a male rights movement or, or, or better still a male prerogative movement. And many of the greatest feminist concerns converge there violence against women, woman hating, lesbian hating, male sexuality, male violent sexuality, prostitution, pornography, the feminist agenda itself. So, so uh, as a subject matter, it is it's fascinating and I enjoyed a lot writing these books. I, I'm very happy to ha have done it. Many years ago, it amazed me that there were people who claimed to have been born in the wrong body. Of course, I didn't swallow that narrative because I don't believe in souls and I understood how sex roles work. But I truly believed there was something that drove them to, to take so drastic solutions other than what Sheila Jeffries revealed in penal imperialism recently. Uh, that is fetishist. Uh, but well, that's why when I started writing Gender Identity, Lies and Dangers, I already possessed a copy of the first book about transsexuality aimed at the lay person. The first self-help book for transsexuals indeed, published in 1996, because I was already interested in the subject. But I didn't find any satisfactory answer there in that book. It remained a mystery until I understood it was just a lie, a big fat lie. Just as there is not such thing as the wrong body, there is not such thing as a gender identity. The first person I read who tackled this topic directly was the political philosopher Rebecca Riley Cooper. She had a blog called More Radical with Age, which seems she has herself erased since. And her essay, Gender is Not a Spectrum, is what, with what I read initially. It is still there. Uh, uh, you can read it. It's amazing. And I wanted to know about this woman, and I found out she was a lecturer in, in political theory at the University of Warwick, and she said about her, uh, I'm quoting her, I am now especially interested in the challenge posed to class-based liberation movements by the shift towards identity politics, and in particular, the implications of this for feminist theory and practice. I have written extensively about the nature of sex, gender, and identity, and I'm currently in the process of completing a book on the subject entitled The Politics of Gender Identity, a Feminist Critique, to be published by Paul Grave Macmillan in late 2016. I spent months eagerly awaiting for that book to be published, but it never happened. That, that remains a mystery. The book was never published, and nor Paul Grave Macmillan nor Riley Cooper said a word about it. I, I gather this, the manuscript somewhere, but the book doesn't exist. And then Rebecca Riley Cooper, who was a great, um, uh, com uh, uh, she gave some great conference that are that you can find in the internet. I quote one of them in my book. Uh, 
she disappeared from the, let's call it, gender critical scene for personal reasons. But suddenly, after so much radio silence from the publishing industry, I, I mean, I was waiting for that book because there was not much there. There, there were blogs, some interviews with feminists, but almost no books. Uh, uh, there were, of course, there were two great books. I will mention them in a minute, but there were no, not, not new productions about it. But suddenly, after so much radio silence from the publishing industry, there were a good handful of interesting books about this subject. For example, Female Erasure, edited by Ruth Barrett, the Abolition of Sex by Karadansky, Gender Critical Feminism by Holly Lawford Smith. By the way, these three, the, these three women are here right now and I, I, I appreciate it so much. The, this Trans When Ideology Meets Reality by Helen Joyce, Material Girls by Kathleen Stock, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier, Transgender Body Politics by Heather Bronskill Evans. Ah, oh, no, no, Holly Lawford Smith is not here. It's Heather who is here, sorry. Uh, on the Meaning of Sex by Kaisaiki Sekman, and uh, Double Think by Janice Raymond. These last three books were published by Spinif Express and are among the best on the list. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have an independent and truly feminist press. But, um, so it was amazing that finally new books were being published on the subject of transgenderism and they gave me more information examples, references, and food for thought. But at the same time, that meant that it would be more difficult for me to write something original about transgenderism. Although in the Spanish speaking world, world there were not so many books, only maybe Delirio y Misoginia Trans by Alicia Millares and Nadie Nace en un Cuerpo Equivocado by Jose Rasti and Marino Perez Alvarez, two men who are not feminist, but that was it. And nothing wrote in Mexico, my country. Uh, even though there were not so many books in Spanish, I didn't want to merely repeat what others had, had already said. I wanted to be part of the worldwide conversation we feminists were having. Well, maybe I succeeded in offering something original to the reader, even though so many books have been published already. And also I wanted to be read by feminists who already know what is happening. And at the same time, I wanted, as Heather Brunskill Evans suggested in the launch of transgender body politics, speak out to alert the ordinary person who hasn't quite grasped the seriousness of it. And I think I did manage to offer something original. First of all, I acknowledge the fundamental role of Janice Raymond and Sheila Jeffries in this debate. Believe it or not, there are women who write with some sense of entitlement about transgenderism who seem completely unaware of the fact that there is a book called The Transsexual Empire published, published by Janice Raymond in 1973, and a book called Gender Hurts published by Sheila Jeffries in 2014, who already foresaw and explained what was breaking out in 2017, 2018, 2019, and has but grown bigger and more powerful since. So imagine writing about it and not mentioning these radical feminists and their analysis. Imagine writing about female erasure and actively participating in that erasure by ignoring the history of women who thought and wrote about these same topics before you were even aware of gender identity ideology being a thing. Another original contribution for my book is a part that was the most entertaining to write, an unpacking of a typical transgenderist piece. Why Chimamanda Nosy Adiki's comments about trans women are wrong and dangerous by Jarune Uwujaren, who presents himself as Nigerian American writer and feminist and a non-binary trans person. This was going to be two or three pages but it ended being 25 pages long. <laughs> well, and, and last but not least, another original thing in my book is a chart. There's a chart in, in pages, let me tell you, in, in pages 100, 119 and 120. 
And in the second chapter, three theories about transgenderism, there's this chart, which compares what the three main explanations or models about transgenderism have in common. The medical sexological model, as I call them it, the transgender model, and the radical feminist model. As there are people who believe that gender identity ideology aims to abolish gender stereotypes, this chart shows, you, you mentioned it, uh, Bronwyn, this chart shows the transgender model agrees with the gender abolitionists in only one moment. Although they talk about depathologizing their identity, the truth is the transgender model and the medical sexological model walk hand in hand almost the whole time. And I, finally, I, I would like to read a short section from this chapter, which is called Goat Testicles and other miracle cures. And it says, finally, another embodiment of the medical sexological model are the many plastic surgeons who perhaps willing to use their knowledge and skills to help others, or perhaps because it is a lucrative business and who are they to refuse to do what the client asks? Are taking advantage of the fact that in many places, the requirements such as a diagnosis of gender dysphoria for these major surgeries, advertised as transgender health services, have disappeared. There has been a resulting boom in surgical interventions for men claiming to have a feminine gender identity, or double mastectomies, hysterectomies, and phalloplasties among young girls who have considered themselves transgender or non-binary. These interventions do not serve to cure a disease, but at best to fulfill a fantasy or alleviate a psychological discomfort, and even the latter remains to be confirmed in the absence of conclusive studies contrasting risks and benefits and analyzing long-term outcomes. Very famous in this group is Miami-based Dr. Said, Said Gallagher, who has a TikTok account aimed at young women seeking to affirm their gender by denying their sex. Reader, do not imagine a physician seriously explaining what this or that sur surgery involves its risks, risks, recovery time, possible alternatives to the scalpel. No, this is someone who jokes about and trivializes the issue in a cheerful way in an attempt to get potential clients to like her. As one 13-year-old girl whose two breasts were removed by Gallagher a month after she contacted, she contacted her, as, as this girl puts it, she has a great personality. A savvy marketeer and skilled communicator, Gallagher has a slogan that sums up her casual attitude to her modus vivendi, eating the tits. Smiling and with a greedy look on her face, she shows photos of girls with a naked torso and visible scars who have already made use of her services. She assures us that it hurts very little. Her requirements are minimal, and anyone would think that having a mastectomy or a phalloplasty with her would be less cumbersome and less significant than going to the dentist to get a feeling. Gallagher is not alone in using social media to her advantage and the direct access to clientele it provides. Dr. Hugh A. McLean's clinic in Ontario, which treats hundreds of young women seeking a flat chase, boasted 14,000 followers on Instagram in 2020. The image of the handsome surgeon Giancarlo McEvenu wearing a Santa hat, holding up with a misshapen expression, a bucket labeled breast tissue in each hand, accompanied by the caption, for all you good boys, Dr. McEvenu is not bringing gifts, he's taking them away, is famous. In response to criticism for the tasteless joke, he said it was just a relaxed comment to celebrate all the patients who had cosmetic mastectomies during the festive season. These propagandistic practices are less novel than one might, that, than one might think. Bob Ostertag recounts the case of the notorious John R. Brinkley, a cancer surgeon who in the 1920s and 1930s made his fortune by allegedly transplanting goat testicles into human males, a procedure that promised to, to rejuvenate them and restore virility. Other colleagues did it with monkey testicles. Advertising his services through a high wattage radio station he had built for this purpose, 
he foreshadowed, I'm quoting Kostertag, he foreshadowed the role of the internet and direct to consumer prescription medicine advertising. End of, of, of quote. After two decades of deceiving the old worry, Brinkley was banned from continuing to practice medicine, not because he performed totally useless operations, but because he was found to have faked his medical credentials. He is generally, generally remembered, says Ostertag, as a huckster and swindler who did not believe in the efficacy of his own surgeries. Yet he can just as he can just as easily be understood as a smart guy who realized that there are medical procedures that work because people believe they work. So why not give people what they want? Uh, end of quote. The highly successful Spanish plastic surgeon Ivan Manero, formerly head of the gender disorders unit at Barcelona's hospital clinic also gives people what they want, just not always. It is very revealing to know when this phalloplasty expert honors his client's wishes and when he does not. So I quote uh, from him, from Manero himself. When it is clear that the patient in front of us is a transsexual man, not many psychological criteria are needed. This person has had this desire since childhood, so the operation only brings happiness for the patient. It increases his self-esteem. You have to imagine that the transsexual man is a patient who looks like a man on the outside. With his beard, his receding hairline, his musculature. In other words, he's a man from top to bottom and was born with a vagina. When a phallus is given to him, that is what he desires. It can be compared to a man who needs a heart and is going to have it transplanted. It is another organ, albeit a sexual one, which may have cultural or religious connotation, but it is still an organ. Now, when this intervention is aimed, is aimed at men who have gym syndrome, it is different. If the patients are men who look at the penis, see it as small compared to the others, and come to the consultation requesting a bigger and thicker penis, in many cases, a psychological report is necessary because the vast majority of the time, they don't need anything and the surgeon has to refuse to do an intervention that they don't need. If the patient is very insistent, he probably has to be referred to a psychologist because what we have here is a disorder called dysmorphophobia of which anorexia is a subtype. This pathology is suffered by patients who see themselves differently from the way they really are. Whether it is the 45 pounds skinny girl who thinks she is fat, or the boy who has a normal penis I think, and thinks it is very small. In these cases, a psychological report is mandatory. End of quote. Now that he is running his own clinic and a foundation that bears his name, Dr. Maniero is rarely forced to refuse to perform this surgery, considering that, as he reports, the most common patient profile today, far more than men with a micropenis or who have had penile cancer or an, or an amputation due to an accident, is the transsexual man. It is not clear what is more admirable about this Spanish doctor. His entrepreneurship which, as his website boasts, has established him as one of the best aesthetic and reconstructive plastic surgeons nationally and internationally, or his ability to distinguish at first glance and without a shadow of a doubt between a man looking for an unnecessary operation and a man born in a woman's body. And this is what I wanted to read to you. And before uh, finishing, I have some thank yous to give. Of course, I, um, um, I have to acknowledge the amazing team at, Spin at Spinif Express, including, of course, Renata Klein, Susan Hawthorne, Pauline Hopkins, Rachel Mc Mc McDermott. Thank you very much for, 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 your, for your work with this book. And of course, Sheila Jeffries, Julia Long, Janice Raymond, and Bronwyn Winter for those beautiful endorsements. And thank you, 
thank you all, uh, all for coming today to, to this global launch. Thank you. So back to you, Bronwyn. Um, <clears throat> actually, we, we are going oh. to have to, <laughs> I'm going to just come in here and say we, we're, going, we're nearly at an hour, so we are going to finish up. So I'm going to pass uh, to Renata uh, for, her, for her to do our thank yous. Thank you, Renata. Thank you very much, Susan and Bronwyn, and of course, Laura, for your very interesting and good words. Um, it was fascinating working uh, on this book with Laura, uh, because Laura uh, obviously had to translate it, which was is a big achievement, because translation is really like uh, writing a new book. And so thank you very much, Laura, for putting in months and months and months uh, of doing this work and then um it was fantastic especially for pauline hopkins and me to get this chapter sometimes it would be a month before we get the next chapter and um it was like a serial novel that you can read in a magazine or something um what we didn't quite realize was how big the book was getting and so <laughs> because we got the single chapters we it wasn't put together and so at the end we realized we had quite a bit of a monster of a book but that's meant in the nicest possible way as robin morgan says you know monsters are good women and especially radical feminists need monsters so so I really, really commend this book to you. Um, as Bronwyn said at the beginning, uh, it is so good to actually have a book um, that looks at cultures in Mexico, also in Spain, and gives other examples and not is not entirely uh, Western based. So that that is one of the big, big uh, new things about the book. But it's also written with uh, so much wit, uh, 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 wit and irony. It's a pleasure to read. Um, now, as I always say at the Spinifex launch, uh, books don't just make themselves. They wouldn't. We wouldn't be able to publish these books if we didn't have such a fabulous team. So I will mention the members, which is uh, who are Daniel Osborne, our uh, our uh, office manager, uh, who does fabulous thing to keep us all in line. Caitlin Roper, who is our social media person, is very good on Instagram and X and will uh, push your words around and is very good at not um, going into when we get attacked. We're actually not getting that much attacked. It's really quite weird. Um, Susan Hawthorne, I really want to mention who is the grand, the grand dumb of um, Spinifex Press, who also puts us... Uh, in line, makes us make sure we do our thing. Then Rachel McDermott, who I have to say, uh, actually sacrifices her weekend so that she can make sure that this uh, Zoom launch is going over well. So thank you very much, Rachel. That's really beyond what you, what anybody should do. So thank you. Um, and Pauline Hopkins, who sadly can't be here because she works in a bookshop on Saturdays. And I really, really want to thank her between Pauline and me. We, uh, as I said, had the great privilege of uh, reading the first uh, installment of, of uh, Laura's book. Uh, and Susan kept saying, I want to read it too. I want to read it too. And I said, no, 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 not yet. Needs to go back to Laura, and then Laura was very good at making all the things that we said. Oh, it's not clear. You need to make, write that clearer. And then finally, Susan could read, was allowed to read it too, and um, so we're very, very proud to have published this book. Now, those of you who already have a copy or a PDF will maybe notice how beautiful the book looks inside as well. And that is due to Helen Christie, who sets all our books and really puts in an, an awful lot of really love and dedication to uh, the Spinifex books, that they look beautiful. And outside, it looks beautiful also. And that cover is by Deb Snipson, who also does our cover and similarly puts a lot of love into doing book covers for Spinifex. And actually for me, it's one of the nicest things about publishing books to say, give, give Deb a brief 
and say, all right, we need another cover. And then they come in and it's so exciting to see what she thought of. And sometimes it's really weird. Uh, but this one, I think we got that very quickly and we, we all agreed it is a very, very beautiful cover. Uh, I think Rachel, you will get the uh, cover up at the end. So if you don't have a copy yet, I really, really hope that you will get yourself. It's a it's a book that um, together with the other Spinifex books that uh, you mentioned, Laura, Heather's book, Heather Bronsky Levin's books. That was the first, actually, that we published. And then uh, later, um, Janice Raymond's book, Double Sync, which is also now in German and goes into Italian as we speak. And um, Silvia Guerini, which is one of the newer books that you should all read. She goes into transhumanism at the main. So we're very, very proud of our... Um, wonderful collection of radical feminist books that um you know speak the truth about this these lies because they are and it's really important to say that the transgender child is a lie gender identity is a lie we just have to repeat it until finally people get it and in australia we are really behind the feminists in the uk we are still getting hammered by uh, institutions such as the Human Rights Commission, for instance, who, who, who just came out with a broadside again. They're soliciting um, uh, uh, um, views from the transgender committee, co community, how they are victimized and how awful it is to be so-called transgender and live in Australia. And of course, not a question about also soliciting comments from women and girls and what this all means for us. That is just not, it's not even in, in their radar. Uh, transgender people are victims and we are, well, we're obviously stupid, bad, turfs, that need to be, you know, violated against and basically gotten out of this world. So um, the, we will win in the end, it will go away, it will be seen, well, it will be one of the worst medical experiments what is happening to children. And I just recently read a new, um, an essay that, I mean, I knew about puberty blockers and how bad they were, but there were, was really very disturbing effects that puberty blockers have on children's brains. And so this, this is really what we're doing is just a, a medical violation of uh, some uh, uh, someone's future that um, it, it, it is absolutely a scandal. It's a crime that these operations and these puberty blockers donations are still allowed to go ahead. They should really all be stopped. It will be stopped, but it will take maybe another few years. Uh, so now, if um, I think this probably is the end of uh, this uh, very exciting launch again, I'm thanking, I uh, thank Bronwyn very much for her very um, good words, interesting words, and of course, Laura as well. And I can just really hope that you all who are here uh, pass on the news about this book and the other Spinifex books on this topic uh, over to your friends and please go read it and spread the gospel. Thank you very much for coming today.